so I've been working in the field of um, trauma, military mental health and PTSD now uh, since, for about 17 years, since 2003, where um, I was studying for my undergraduate psychology degree at Glasgow uh, Uni and um, there was the uh, 2003 uh, invasion of Iraq. And um, this, this kind of coincided with Easter, hol Easter holidays and instead of revising, I kind of watched this sort of very strange phenomenon of, of an invasion in Iraq. Uh, but got kind of really interested in thinking about the psychological consequences of this. Subsequently, I got a job at King's College London University uh, to help set up and run a, a very large scale project looking at the health and well-being of military personnel that went to Iraq uh, and, and then a group who didn't. This has been running now for, for that 17 years as well. Um, and uh, what I really was interested in there was learning more about PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I first did a, a PhD there, but uh, wanted to get a bit more hands-on clinical experience, so retrained as a clinical psychologist, and then joined Combat Stress in 2013. Just at a time where Combat Stress, so for, for, for your listeners who don't know, Combat Stress is a, it's, it's a, a national mental health charity in the UK that really has been focusing on supporting the needs of veterans with mental health difficulties. We've been around for over 100 years now, just set up after World War One. And for the last 10 years, we've been far more focused on meeting the kind of clinical needs of, of, of veterans with mental health difficulties. And I joined at a time where Combat Stress were thinking about expanding and thinking a bit more about research and, and proper formal evaluation of some of the services. So I was tasked with kind of setting up and now running a research department, which I, which I do. In addition, I, um, I've taken over the presidency of an organisation called the UK Psychological Trauma Society. This is a multidisciplinary group of practitioners working in the field of psychotraumatology. Uh, we're linked into various other networks. So I wear several kind of hats. And on top of that, I still do some clinical work, working with uh, a variety of, of, of different uh, people, unfortunately, who have experienced symptoms of PTSD. It's amazing, isn't it, how like our human experiences direct the narrative by which, you know, we go into work and stuff like that. So that 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 short easter break where there so happened to be a war unfolding on our hands has kind of led to you getting involved in this uh, aspect of psychological research yeah even though i can trace it probably further back to i mean i think we all have things in our backgrounds that yeah draw us to certain areas and um and experiences but but yeah contingency and luck play a big part sometimes yeah yeah and i think before we get into the whole subject of ptsd and how we treat it and and how pivotal combat stress is uh, particularly for veterans maybe we should define exactly what we mean because i think it's one of those terms that is banded around quite a bit without a true understanding of what the umbrella term is and, and what it can refer to as well I, exactly i think it is a um... It, it's useful that it's banded around a lot, but having a clear understanding is, is extremely helpful. So post-traumatic stress disorder is a collection of symptoms that are very common in people that have gone through ex very difficult experiences. Um, we can think about those symptoms clustering in kind of three different groups. Well, before I get there, the, the first point is people need to be exposed to a traumatic experience. And traumatic experiences, whilst they vary a lot, the kind of the working definition is it's a trauma where someone's life or someone else's life has been put at risk and that we've witnessed this or there could be a damage to our own personal integrity in some ways such as being tortured or things like this so but you know we have that kind of threshold that's an important part you can't have ptsd without exposure to a trauma mm -hmm. off then the sort of symptoms we see um cluster within three groups we have what we think of as reliving symptoms people re-experiencing some of these difficult symptoms again. These can be through very difficult nightmares where they're kind of replaying aspects of the trauma through intrusive thoughts or, or feelings, or sometimes at the more extreme end through sort of uh, flashbacks where people are reliving kind of some of the traumas as if they're happening right now again. Naturally, this, these cause a whole array of what we think of as hyperarousal symptoms. So things like feeling on edge all the time, having an exaggerated startle response, so there's a loud bang, really kind of being distracted by it. Uh, sleep difficulties, anger, irritability, and lots of problems with concentration. Because if your mind is constantly in the past, focusing on potential dangers, it's very hard to be in the present and focus on what's going on. 
which then can have some serious implications for try being you know for work for relationships for, or just for looking after ourselves and then the third set of symptoms which we think of the set of symptoms that maintain some of the PTSD symptoms are what we think of as avoidance symptoms so these can be conscious avoidance symptoms so things like avoiding looking at news articles about particular traumas avoiding reading about them or avoiding trying to go to certain places so that something bad happened in a pub avoiding going to a pubs or they can be more unconscious where a lot of the people I work with sort of emotionally very numb they kind of don't feel any experience they don't they report not feeling any sort of emotions, feeling very flat. Now, what I often say when patients, people I work with, when I describe that, they kind of say, yeah, but, you know, what's, why is this? And I kind of think, well, in a way, it's a sort of a maladaptive way that the brain has developed to help keep us safe. So we, 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 people have gone through these difficult experiences, and it's not a real trauma list, but I'm just taking it as an example if, we, if we've been attacked by a dog, well, you know, it is a bad trauma, but it's not as bad as some of the other ones. If we've been attacked by a dog and that dog's bitten us and it really hurts and it, we bled, we had feelings that we might die, and that, that's a sort of a trauma memory. And then when next time we're walking down the street and we see another dog, that memory comes back to us very kind of vividly as if it's happening again here and now. And then that kind of hyper kind of arousal symptoms kick in, more adrenaline gets released, and we kind of go into a sort of fight or flight or maybe a freeze response. We run away from the dog. And by doing that, we're avoiding it. So we're disconfirming the belief that the dog actually isn't going to harm us. Because, you know, most dogs are kind of lovely and friendly. And, uh, and so it kind of, that, that kind of pattern maintains it. But actually, by, by doing that, it's kind of keeping us, our brains trying to keep us safe from being exposed to any of these dangers again. So it's very unpleasant. So the people I work with really describe feeling as if the traumas are happening again right now in the present day and in that constant state of anxiety and agitation uh, which you know, you can, I can hope you can imagine is, is, is very difficult and distressing for people. Absolutely and we seem to uh, solely think about PTSD in the context of um, veterans and people who have experienced war. Um, what other sorts of people have perhaps not through your clinical work with combat stress particularly, but what other sorts of experiences might fall into that into that category of people who could suffer with PTSD? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an excellent point. I think we, uh, and I, I'm, I'm obviously working within the field of military mental health, and there's a lot of research has gone into that. But actually, veterans, military are a relatively small part of society. And there's a whole array of other people that are exposed to traumas in their everyday life. Um, so for example, you know, these could be getting into fights, getting into car, having car crashes and, you know, instances of domestic abuse. Um, people have lived some very difficult childhood experiences of childhood abuse. A lot of refugees that come, a lot of people that end up coming to our country often are coming because they're escaping persecution from very difficult environments or sometimes the journey in themselves, the journey uh, away from from one country to another can be extremely d difficult. So I think trauma is it's quite prevalent across the population, and lots of different people are exposed to traumas. But just because you're exposed to trauma doesn't mean you get PTSD. Mm -hmm. So, for example, men typically report high levels of exposure to trauma because of things like seeing acts of violence. But women seem to be more likely to develop, unfortunately, symptoms of PTSD because the traumas they're exposed to are more interpersonal. For things like sexual violence, things like domestic abuse, so I think you know trauma can touch any of us. Yeah, and um, as well as um, uh, the different types of, of trauma here, the, the reason why we're discussing uh, this today is because, in the wake of what is happening with uh, COVID nineteen and the uh, difficult decisions that uh, a number of different healthcare workers are having to make over the <coughs> course of time, we have to be slightly aware of the potential for PTSD in the future, as well yeah. as some other papers that I've come across as well that we'll get into a little bit later about current uh, training pre-pandemic and, and the prevalence of PTSD-like symptoms. Um, so just before we get into that, there's one more definition I think we should probably uh, establish, which is something you mentioned earlier, moral injury. What, yeah. what is a moral injury? How do, how do, we, how do we define that and, and how does that relate to PTSD? Also, moral injury is, is a 
a relatively new term uh, in the literature, which is really, it's about defining profound psychological distress, which results from actions or lack of them that violate one's moral or ethical code. So uh, to be more concrete, this can be um, in some of the veterans we've worked with, they've, they've talked about, for example, being in, on certain deployments where they may have wanted to help the locals by giving them food or things like this, but feeling unable to do that, that's violating their moral code. And then they're seeing, you know, some pretty dire consequences of not being able to feed people that are starving. Mm. Um, and so that, I think that's kind of our kind of working definition of moral injury. How it relates to PTSD is it's, it's important to know that moral injury isn't a mental health disorder in its own right. Um, but what we think of moral injury is highly associated with complex, with, with PTSD. Uh, and it's also unfortunately associated with suicidality. So it seems to be an overlapping construct with, with, with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and, and because of this, it seems to be not just overlapping with PTSD, but overlapping with the more complex presentations that we sometimes see clinically in people mm -hmm. with complex PTSD. And thinking about, we don't want to jump ahead too much, but thinking about what's going on now with, with COVID-19, I think there's a lot of people that are being exposed to not only awful traumas, in, in their everyday, you know, in, in their working practice, but also being exposed to some very difficult decision-making around kind of the allocation of resources, which patients to treat, which patients they can't treat, or, or just the communication with family members and, and lots of different things that might be uh, morally more, more difficult and challenging. And so that I think there is a definite risk that people might be exposed to a whole of, I'm talking about really NHS staff here, might be exposed to a whole risk of very complex mental health uh, uh, difficulties. Yeah. And, and before we go into like the kind of treatments that we have for um, uh, PTSD and moral injury and how they might overlap going forward, as well as the experience of combat, st um, uh, combat stress, mm -hmm. um, one of the things you mentioned there was uh, a maladaptive way that the brain has responded to a traumatic event, which we discussed earlier, it can be a whole bunch of different things. What kind of things predispose a brain to react inappropriately, or perhaps appropriately is, is of the argument to say, but how, what kind of things can predispose someone to have PTSD in the first place? Because there are a number of associations that I'm aware of, and I'm trying to unpick exactly why those might be. Yeah, I mean, so in some of the research literature uh, really suggests there are some obvious risk factors. So pre-trauma, uh, one of the biggest risk factors is exposure to a whole array of childhood adversity, uh, particularly more complex types of abuse in childhood that can, might predispose people. Now, why this is, you know, it's hard to really know, but from my clinical experiences and from some research data, uh, it seems that, unfortunately, people, part of growing up is often about learning how to really regulate our emotions. Particularly, you know, you think, when we're born, the kind of one of the areas that really grows a lot is the frontal lobes uh, and, and, and the very you know, central to emotional regulation and executive function. And particularly things like the way oxytocin is released and stuff like this with good caregivers. Now, if unfortunately people grow up in more adverse environments, sometimes we don't learn helpful ways to regulate our own emotions. Or we may have very difficult views about ourselves, the world and other places. So if you're growing up in an environment where every time you're upset, a primary caregiver, instead of comforts you, which if they kind of comfort you and they comfort you again and again, oxytocin, there's a hormone gets released mm -hmm. that helps bring down our emotions. And we learn over time to, to internalize that uh, emotional re regulation. If when the opposite happens, we get upset and our caregivers shout at us, shame us, abuse us. We, we don't learn that emotions, are, we don't learn a way to regulate our emotions. So emotions become extremely scary and difficult to manage. Then we come along to a trauma and actually traumas, you know, they're, they're not, not everyone's exposed to traumas. So, mm. you know, you know, people get exposed to difficult traumas. We all have different ways of managing. If we are predisposed to not be able to regulate our emotions quite so well, we're more likely to, uh, dissociate during the trauma which means sort of not be fully present or we're more likely to be so distressed by the trauma we can't do the natural kind of processing of a traumatic event mm. 
So in a lot of the clients I work with, they often turn to alcohol as a way to manage, to try to, to manage traumas, which doesn't, which gets in the way of the natural kind of processing or become workaholics and just try and fill their day with work. So they're not thinking about the traumas. So the predisposing stuff, the childhood stuff seems very important. The type of traumas we're exposed to, unfortunately, are related to kind of how our, our, the chance of developing PTSD. The more interpersonal, the more violations of trust between between people in our social circle, that, that increases the chance. The more they're repeated. So being uh, some of the language we use, this single incident trauma, like a car crash, is less risky for PTSD than and for, like living uh, with spousal abuse. There's a repeated awful type of interpersonal trauma that's happening a lot that people can't escape. If people dissociate during the trauma, which I kind of mentioned earlier, so it's so bad their mind takes them elsewhere, that's, that's a big risk factor. Also post-trauma, we know that the people that have less social support around them, so the people that are less, feel less able to talk to their friends, their family, maybe uh, healthcare workers in the immediate kind of aftermath of trauma is, are, are also more likely to develop more complex PTSD type reactions in the longer term. It's um yeah no it's 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 a really interesting topic and I just want to digress very briefly if I could because I think yeah. there might be a lot of listeners thinking well I've got young children at the moment I'm going through quite a troublesome time whether it be financial difficulties whether it be the yeah. lack of interpersonal skills how do we kind of shelter children from this potential of um, uh, lack of oxytocin <coughs> lack of uh, appropriate responses to questions from children or even just the living in a household with kids everyone around you don't want to give them a negative experience of what is basically a time where everyone's together in the same household at the moment so before we go on to to talk about yeah, yeah. ptsd and, and the, the wider uh, aspect perhaps that's just something to touch on i mean i think that that's an excellent point and it's not i guess you know protecting children but protecting each other as well is it, it's 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 an extremely difficult time we're living through right now i mean some of the advice i would give and i give clinically is think about what we can control and what we can't control the things some of us can control are things like um actually ensuring if we're able to get as much exercise as we can mm -hmm. you know actually taking the advice going out that one once a day for exercise but also doing exercise at home trying to do things like actually limit the amount of media exposure we expose ourselves to in, 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 in the, you know, and, or social media as well. So there's a lot of very difficult news stories out there at the moment and trying to be more um, uh, managed with our kind of our relationship with both the media, but with also social media. I think so the kind of, they're kind of key things. I think other things is kind of actually making time to talk about how people are feeling, our emotional well-being. Now, with, with children, a really good exercise I often recommend is something called a bag of emotions. So sometimes kids don't always have the emotional language that we have, or sometimes I don't, and it's easier for me to express like this as well. But we, you can, you know, you could draw a pretend sack on a bit of paper, and within it you can draw lots of different ways to express emotions, like balloons or colours. And it's about giving children or anyone really, but giving people an express, a way to express how they're feeling and the different types of thoughts and feelings that they may be having and allow a parent to have that kind of conversation and be able to hear kind of what the, what the experience is like for the children. I think, you know, we, I'm a parent as well. And, mm. and, you know, maybe my wife maybe thinks I'm not a very good parent, who knows, but I think, <laughs> As much as it's about good enough sometimes and it's about trying and it's about and, and not putting too much pressure on ourselves as well at the moment. Like I think, you know, the, the challenges of work and homeschooling or just being locked in the house with everyone. It's about trying to make time each day to show your children that you really you need to you, you, you want to know what they're thinking and feeling. And I think that's what's important right now to let kids have that kind of connection. So they can feel heard if they're, if they're feeling difficult emotions, which we probably all are feeling at this time. You know, yeah. I know that advice was for children, but I, th I think that really resonates with me at the moment. Um, certainly trying to maintain the connections that have obviously been lost through the yeah. lack of physical contact and trying to do that via the 
Skype or Zoom or whatever collaboration tool you're using. <laughs> um, but spending time to explore the irrationality of the way that some of my friends and some of my family members are feeling and and the exact same for myself as well, putting myself through the, the lens of the traumatic experiences right now. I think it's yeah. really important to have those open, honest conversations at length and without distraction. Um, which has been uh, one of the, I think, positives out of this, the fact that we actually have time to dedicate to those and actually taking advantage of the increased amount of time that we have to have those conversations too. Um, and the neurobiological element of it really does fascinate me, particularly um, when we're looking at kids as well. Um, before we digress too much, perhaps we should talk about um, why, w what uh, sort of things that you're doing at the moment to explore moral injury um, with regard to healthcare workers um, and uh, any sort of uh, things that we should be aware of going forward as a lot of healthcare workers do listen to the podcast. Um, there's a, there's a, so there's a number of different initiatives that are going on. I mean, one of the bigger ones we're involved in is we're trying to do a study of key workers to look at kind of, by we, it's a collaboration between Combat Stress and King's College London University and uh, Oxford University. We're trying to look at the impact of moral injury and its relationship with mental health difficulties on key workers, NHS staff that are, that are kind of on the front line. Because the thing is, moral injury is, is um, as an area of research, is in its infancy. And actually what we need is sensible research right now to better understand the phenomenon, better understand which groups might be more at risk of developing moral injury, uh, psychological distress because of being exposed to potentially morally kind of injurious events. And then thinking about how we can then target kind of how we can support those groups. What we don't want to do is rush in and say, we've got all the answers basically, because we don't. Mm -hmm. And it's about kind of learning together. I think we, there's a lot of research that the team I kind of mentioned, have, we've been working on in the military mental health world that might be very applicable to what's going on now. So we've been doing, for the last few years, been very generously funded uh, by an organisation called the Force and Mind Trust to do work looking at moral injury in UK veterans. Mm -hmm. And part of it is understanding kind of what are, kind of how does moral injury differ from PTSD? And what are, how does it differ? And what are the particular risk factors? So for example, we identify kind of PTSD only as a difficulty, but also a more of a mixed presentation with people with PTSD and moral injury, and they seem to increase the risk of problems. And then it's about trying how we translate some of these findings to the current crisis, what's going on to support kind of NHS staff as best we can. Um, we are also trying to work um, internationally with colleagues from Australia, from Canada and America in this field to generate better ways to measure uh, moral injury, which are more universally acceptable. And more, more universally validated so we can compare and contrast some way but also we can learn from each other's experiences and then the kind of the final thing is we're right now we're in the process of trying to um, develop a new treatment which is tailored to the unique needs of the UK population that may be experiencing kind of that kind of mixed PTSD and moral injury because we think some of the kind of gold standards for PTSD might not be quite right for people that are exposed to moral injury yeah but before we go into the current treatments that are available for ptsd right now and things that yeah. uh, combat stress have been involved in is there a different well, we sort of already touched on this if there's a difference between outcomes based on pre-morbid state or pre-morbid uh, personality or life experiences but and i know i'm kind of asking you to look into a crystal ball right now but would you hypothesize that the personality of a healthcare worker that we would sort of stereotype as altruistic and compassionate could lead to a more severe traumatic experience after the events of the last couple of months or, or is it just and i and i hate to sort of stereotype an entire huge workforce of over a million um but you know what what would you say ab about the kind of personality traits that lead people to go into healthcare in the first place and what their experiences might be in the future um let me answer that in two ways. I think the first is, from a very purely academic perspective, we, we don't have much work done on kind of personality traits. <laughs> we do know the biggest risk factors are things like exposure to childhood adversity, um, and then the types of traumas people are exposed to, and the kind of su suppose, uh, social, support works and, uh, social support networks afterwards. But I, I kind of tap into what you're saying, the other part. I do think that 
you know, I, I, I'm a therapist, a psychological, a clinical psychologist myself. I think one massive generalization, which, may, you know, I think holds up true is that most people enter their healthcare profession because they want to help others. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the kind of ethos is that kind of do no harm to start off with and then try to, you know, make positive changes in people's lives as much as we can. Mm. I, I think, and I, I think then that is, if you think about that as an underlying kind of value system, unfortunately, at the moment, what's happening with COVID is that people are being exposed to some NHS staff, some really horrible, complex situations where actually they might be in conflict with that value system, where people are having to make uh, uh, difficult decisions about the, the allocation of resources on who to ventilate, who not to ventilate, who to kind of triage and who not to triage based on, um, based on resource, not based on kind of the pure kind of what you'd everyone would like to do on clinical need. I think also there's some extremely complicated situations with family members. I've heard some extreme distressing stories about, you know, patients being admitted to ICU, they're not being able to have any contact with their family members not being able to say goodbye and actually doctors, nurses having to have those really complex and difficult, morally difficult conversations with family members um, and having to do things like some really heartbreaking stories about like, you know, getting photographs and things like this. And, and these are really complex things that I think NHS staff are, are being exposed to. Um, and because of the altruistic kind of nature, they might, you know, these are kind of violating some of our moral codes, I think, in some ways. I think, you know, the thing that drives a lot of people into the healthcare profession is to help others and actually being exposed to lots of situations where we can't help other people because of various reasons or we're having to make some really complex phone calls to relatives or, um, or, or not being able to give the kind of level of support we might normally want to be able to give is it, it, really complicated. And I think that might put a lot of people at, potentially at risk of of um of experiencing difficulties but on the other side actually this is you know this is a time where the nhs is drawing together it's working in its maximum efficiency and it's important to remember that most people who get um covid19 get better they do recover and they do leave the hospital and they, and, and it's important to recognize that as well yeah, th there's a couple of points there that I wanted to pick up, actually. Um, so I, I agree. I think this is perhaps one of the most uh, incredible times to work in the NHS um, for the fact that things appear to be seamless in terms of how they uh, work together and how everyone is pulling together in the same direction. It's quite incredible to be part of that, of a multitude of different teams. Um, my personal experience uh, in emergency has been brilliant. Everything seems to be, uh, you know, working and going in the right direction. And the number of changes that we've seen in our department from changing it into two different areas, both red and green, um, representing uh, COVID uh, dirty areas and COVID negative areas has been uh, astounding. The uh, critical response that we've had uh, mirrors that of a major incident on a single and uh, on a daily basis, which again has worked very well. I think we're definitely more prepared than we ever have been. Um, we had a shaky start, obviously, with PPE, but I think that's definitely coming together. In my non-clinical role, um, which still spans clinical knowledge, uh, it's. Um, I'm part of a senior doctor-led team where we liaise with patient families uh, who have loved ones in the intensive care unit that they can't visit, which is completely unprecedented. And so we have to respond in that way by pulling together a a number of different professionals. There, there are consultant dermatologists that I work with, consultant cardiologists, all of which who have had some ICU experience so we can translate what is going on in the intensive care environment, how we're supporting patients as well as um, dealing with the unknown and actually having the humility to say, we don't know what the long-term prognosis is and breaking bad news in that way. I mean, these are some empowering conversations that we've had to have, but the camaraderie is something else. And I think if there's any positive to take from this, it's the experience of working within a healthcare service that apparently has completely turned around into, in the last couple of months and actually is actually working more efficiently than I ever remember in my 10 plus year experience of working within the National Health Service. Um, so so th there are like some amazing things, but also I think we need to be 
uh, sort of pragmatic in that there are going to be people for whatever reason, whether there is uh, a pre-existing condition or whether they have um, things that predispose them that are going to have a, a, a poor psychological outcome after this for the, the for the reasons that we've discussed in terms of the decisions that we're having to make. And prior to this, and this is something I wanted to bring you back on, we've known that pre-pandemic fellows and um, uh, members of, of all different uh, healthcare teams uh, have experienced PTSD-like symptoms. There was a study that came out in the um, uh, British Journal of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology that surveyed 6,000 fellows. They had about 1,000 responders and about one in five of the responders reported clinically significant PTSD symptoms. And uh, one of the most striking things from, from my point of view is that uh, a, there was appeared to be an increased risk of PTSD of those um, from black or uh, Asian or ethnic minority um, background as well. And it was associated with lower job satisfaction, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, all the things that I'm sure we'll, we'll get onto in a bit. And, and linked to staff leaving the specialty as well, which is a, a significant problem across a number of different specialties with people leaving the healthcare service because of exhaustion. So in, in, an, in a, a situation where we've already had this issue pre-pandemic, and I don't want to, you know, catastrophize or sound alarmist, but we really do need to think about this. And this is why I really wanted to have this conversation about the management and what, what things we can uh, provide in a, in sort of like a self-care package. I mean, I think that's, you know, it is, it's important to recognize that, that, People come from a variety of backgrounds, so we're all going to have, you know, but um, PTSD is prevalent for that as well. But it's about the exposure to, to two traumas. And it's well known that people who work in certain professions, healthcare, for example, journalists, may be at increased risk of PTSD compared to other professions that aren't. Um, mm. I think it's not just that there might be predisposing risk factors for individuals. These only increase your risk fact, your risk. But actually, anyone that's exposed to very complicated traumatic experiences can be at, at, at risk, irrelevant of their risk, irrelevant of their backgrounds or whatever. Um, you know, I didn't know about that research or particularly about the kind of the minority groups being at risk. And I wonder what, what that is, whether it's about stigma, about seeking support, whether it's about perceived um, kind of um, other barriers to other areas and professions, I don't know. but. It is, it is worrying when there are obvious groups that are at increased risk. Uh, if ever, rather, if everyone's being exposed to the same level of traumas, but there are, there are particular groups that are at increased risk of developing PTSD-like symptoms, I think that is something that we mm. need a lot more work doing to understand why that is. Because it won't be, mm. well, my personal opinion, it won't be about the individuals. It'll be about something more systemic that's going on for that group of individuals. Um, and then because of that, it might give us an opportunity to think how better to support those sort of more vulnerable groups. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, I was quite surprised to see that come out in the, um, in the data that they provided for that. And there might be some other examples of um, prevalence of PTSD um, symptoms uh, in, in, in other specialties. That was just from, particularly from obstetrics and gynecology earlier this year, which is why it came to mind. Um, but it just seems that, you know, we run on adrenaline in normal times and these are abnormal times and this is something that we do need to prepare for. So, so, so going back to sort of the kind of work that you do with combat stress, which I've looked at, it looks amazing. What kind of, uh, what is the suite of different event interventions that we have, um, both uh, pharmaceutical and, and non-pharmaceutical? And, and, and how do you see perhaps translating some of this knowledge uh, that we have um, from your work uh, into something that could prepare us uh, going forward. You mean in terms of supporting staff with PTSD? Yes. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I, to, to take a, a sort of step back a second, I come back stress, we work with veterans that have, that have had um, PTSD, that have PTSD, many of them. And often they've had PTSD for many, many years. And actually we've got really we have some quite um, standardized kind of programs where we're kind of ensuring best practice and kind of the nice guidelines for trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy. And we get good outcomes. 
And I think it's it's about recognising actually we do have very good, well established treatments for PTSD, but it's about helping people access those treatments. For some with more complex needs, we might need better treatments, but for the majority, we have good treatments and it's how we best, it's about getting people access to those treatments. Now, one of the things that I, I'm sure we'll agree on this is that often I see in, in kind of healthcare staff is that sort of putting other people first before their own needs. Yeah, absolutely. And actually that kind of cracking on at all, at all costs. And actually, I think you said, you know, right now it's a bit like a major disaster for every single day. And I think actually we need to, some of the things that we've learned from combat stress from the, and some of the work we've done in Kings and how we can translate that to the NHS right now is really helping frontline staff be made aware of the possibility of, the, of actually they're going to be exposed to potentially morally injurious events. And that's some, what some of the common thoughts and feelings might be around that. And kind of trying to discuss this as much as we can, to uh, particularly facilitated by those in leadership roles that might help develop some sort of more uh, preparedness and to recognize in staff kind of the, what some of the symptoms of distress might be and that these are normal as well. It's normal to have these thoughts and feelings because actually, if you look at people who are exposed to traumas, most people will have PTSD type symptoms in the immediate aftermath of a trauma, but these normally wane and for the vast majority disappear very, very quickly. But for some, they need, a, you know, some they might stay for a month or two uh, and then they're the people that might need extra support. So it's about kind of saying these are the symptoms that might happen and, and sort of preparing people for that. I think also some of the stuff we've learned is the importance of encouraging frontline staff to seek informal support, particularly from, from some of the work we've done at Combat Stress, for example, the importance of having really good trained peer supporters, whether these are colleagues or managers, they can offer some really good peer-led support with this idea of the kind of the nip it in the bud and, and talking, you know, helping people access support straight away rather than leaving them to uh, dwell on some of the difficulties they might be having. But at the same time, I think, you know, informal support can only go so far. And for people that are experiencing significant distress and that that distress is, is staying for, you know, a month or two months, actually, this is when we should be trying to help encourage people to access professional support as quickly as we can. I'm really encouraged to know that I'm working in other kind of trauma groups. Uh, there's one really great one that's been led out of UCL that Combat Stress are involved in that are doing just this. So it's about how to encourage frontline staff to access psychological support as quickly as possible if they need it. Um, and I think, you know, it's an important thing that leaders we have an all have an important role to actively encourage, you know, proactively to check in on staff and to offer that kind of both informal support, but then helping people engage in more formal help seeking where, where necessary. So that, yeah, and you, you know, that, that mirrors a lot with my personal experience, actually. I'm, I'm quite impressed with the response of our, our, our hospital at the moment. So I, I work in West London and um, as part of our team, we have an ICU psychologist that's usually there anyway for the families of patients who are in ICU. Um, obviously, her workload has trebled over the last couple of weeks. Um, and they're also offering and actively seeking out um, uh, work or uh, counseling sessions for the staff themselves. They haven't made it mandatory. And I actually think that sh it should be mandatory because even within myself and within my peer group we do have that sort of alpha mentality of we don't need it we we can power through that and that is very much a medic mindset and again i don't mean to generalize but i think that's certainly prevalent in the type of person that goes into medicine as well um but that kind of psychological support i think has been um uh, really pivotal and it will be pivotal and if i could sort of uh distill a lot of the things that you just said in terms of how we manage this going forward it's awareness it's improving access, which is kind of what's going on in my hospital at the moment. Um, but it's also preventative. Um, and I think there are things that we can do to make sure that we uh, mitigate the potential effects of uh, moral injury or PTSD uh, going forward. And, and I, you know, you picked up on 
on exercise, on alcohol. Um, and the one piece of uh, thing that obviously I'm going to be talking about is nutrition <laughs> and, and how we can actually utilize nutrition and maintain uh, people's mental well-being as well as their overall well-being by making sure that we're, we're being fed and we're being given the actual information about being fed well as well. I completely agree. I mean, if, you know, if people are working long shifts, we actually need to make sure that they're going to make it through those shifts in the, in the best way possible. Um, I think mean, in my work as a psychologist, actually nutrition is something that's very, we, we sometimes, we're so busy, it's something that's overlooked in the sense that often we kind of focus on some of the psychological symptoms, but actually getting a kind of really good basis for people, if they are, it, it can be really helpful. We need to look after ourselves. Yeah. I think another thing about kind of the preventative side of it is there's something about kind of leaders taking responsibility to legitimize it's okay to seek help. It's not a sign of weakness. In some respects, it's sometimes a sign of strength and that by seeking help, you can be, you might be more effective. And those sort of cultural changes as well. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know the exact nature of your service and especially some of the nutrition stuff, but I do know... There are some generalizability stuff from, from the military world, but actually nutrition is taken very seriously because they're thinking about operational effectiveness all the time. And for that, they need people to be, you know, eating the right foods, eating the right foods that are going to release energy over the course of whatever operation they're doing or whatever kind of work function they're doing. They're eating foods that are going to, you know, even things around kind of like sleep and timely daily eat the food to not impinge on sleep and that kind of natural healing and, uh, and restorative times like that. Yeah, and I think like, I mean, I, I hold some nutrition uh, workshops with within the emergency department. I have done prior to um, the pandemic and I think I will be doing where I can fit in my clinical time as well, at least um, trying to find some innovative ways in which I can educate um, without actually being there in person. So some of the stuff that Combat Stress have done as well with regard to teleconferencing uh, and, uh, and tele-workshops as well, which everyone's getting super used to. The, th the, the three main things I talk about um, are alcohol. So a, a lot of people, um, myself included, uh, sort of drinking a little bit more than we're used to drinking. And in my case, it might be a glass of wine every other day uh, or the end of a shift. Um, but And for certain people, let's call it a 10% of the population, as alcohol is an addictive substance, it's something that we need to be careful of um, and to to utilize responsible, responsibly. And I think, you know, the... the, the uh, effects the depression effects of alcohol are well documented so it's something like a, I, don't, I want people to be mindful of not spiraling into the other nutritional impact is um, of, uh, of fats and omega-3 is the one that comes to mind but you know a good quality fats are uh, integral for um, brain function and you know the activation of elements of brain derived neurotrophic factor and signaling pathways and how that helps with the frontal cortex as well um, and our emotional responses and the other thing the last thing is um, simply energy density so and making sure you're looking at the quality of your food so um, we're really lucky at the moment in our store and I'm not too sure if this is mirrored up and down the country but the trust is actually giving all workers uh, in the hospital free food so we don't have to worry about uh, you know, meal prepping the day before or making sure that, you know, we have to go outside and buy something, you know, it's there for us. And that, um, uh, that is a core pillar of well-being. Uh, meditation stuff is great. The X stuff is very important. But a core pillar of well-being is not having to worry about, yeah, making your food and making sure it's healthy before you go in for a 13-hour shift. And I really hope, and it's something that I talked to the NHS food panel about as well. I really hope that that is just something that continues because, uh, you know, it's such a um, it's su it's such a comfort to know that you're being looked after by your hospital and that the food that they're giving you is actually going to be having a direct impact on your nutritional well being, your emotional well being. Um, so yeah, those are the, those are the things that I, I talk about, and and I'd love to see this get uh, uh, be involved a little bit more in, in sort of psychological consults too. I mean, that sounds fantastic from, from from your hospital. I mean, I think if I was going to just pick on, I also agree with all of those pillars, particularly in the psychological sense, alcohol. We we know there's compelling research to show that alcohol has that depressive effect, but there's also compelling research to show that alcohol 
can kind of get in the way of the natural processing of trauma memories. And that, that so, and, and therefore can make we increase our risk of developing PTSD type symptoms in the longer term. It's very common for me as well when I work with patients, that I've worked with people that tell me that, you know, that they're kind of using alcohol, they've been using for a long time to try to push away difficult thoughts and feelings. But actually the very nature of that means that they're not processing those thoughts and feelings. So it kind of keeps people, it can uh, keep them kind of stuck in that kind of uh, very difficult, um, so, uh, we think of it as a, as a, as a kind of uh, maladaptive coping strategy. So it actually maintain some of the symptoms of PTSD. Yeah, I, I think alcohol, you know, it's part of our culture as well, isn't it? We often use alcohol to debrief or to, to close the end of a shift or something like this, but. Absolutely. Right, right. <laughs> I, I'd recommend finding other ways to do that, to have those other, other type of ways to kind of close off a shift, whatever they may be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was joking. I mean, it's it's a it's sort of a cultural thing, like you said, uh, across different industries. Is now I was speaking to an anaesthetic colleague of mine about what's well, the first thing that we're going to do when this is all over, and he said, "Go to the pub," and <laughs> and I resonate with that. You know, it's something that uh, I would love to enjoy um, at the whenever this is over. But um, right now, it's something just to be, to be wary of. Uh, I just want to close by asking you, um, uh, Dominic, what. If you were if you were czar uh, for the day in terms of the psychological well being of healthcare workers up and down the country, what are the interventions that you think should be intervened with regards to uh, mitigating the, the uh, moral injury going forward? What are the things that you would love to see happen um, beyond the things that we've just mentioned here in terms of uh, nutritional well being and, and alcohol? Um, but what are the things that you think we should be thinking about right now in a pragmatic sense? Well, I mean, I think, um, I think uh, firstly, thinking about prevention, I think establishing uh, trained peer support workers that are non-mental health professionals. So it's an informal structure of peer support to help give a space for staff to talk about their thoughts and feelings on a daily basis, because that might make it feel like, one, that would, that would increase accessibility, but it might feel more acceptable to have, have to sp- be able to speak to a trained peer as well, the mental health professionals. I think that might be one that could be a very helpful thing. How that could be facilitated, that could be through online chat or by fake, you know, there might be lots of technological ways to do that. I think the second thing is having really strong leadership to show the importance, just like the importance of nutrition, but the importance of giving us space to, uh, to legitimize having, um, experiencing psychological distress because of the what's going on right now. So I think that's the kind of the, those things up front. I think at the other end, I think research is helpful to, ha- to uh, try to understand which groups are, at the, are going to be at the most, which groups of staff are going to be at the most, um, unfortunately, highest risk factors for developing problems in the longer term. And then in the longer term, I'd be thinking again about those peer support networks to help, help kind of pick up who is really struggling uh, and then have the resources that's necessary to to channel people towards professional support, which is easy and accessible for them to access as well. It might be having to provide this from different trusts, so it kind of so people can feel it's more confidential. Um, but kind of having that easy easy access, so people aren't staff aren't having to go and seek it out. It's almost coming to them if they if they if they uh, if they want it. Yeah, I agree. I think those are great points and spoken like a true academic trying to get the research in there as well. Uh, <laughs> that's um, no, no, that's great. And, and thank you so much, uh, Dominic, for making time today. I, uh, I, I hope um, that this conversation legitimizes it. And I think you're right, leadership in this space to uh, give people um, the, the space to, to voice concerns and actually access treatments if need be um, and prevent uh, a treatment I, I think would be fantastic so I really do appreciate yeah, every all the stuff that you're doing with combat stress and, and how that uh, extends to healthcare as well and thank you very much for inviting me along today thank you so much for watching this video there's so many others for you to enjoy right here check out the doctorskitchen.com sign up to the newsletter where i give science-based recipes every single week there's a podcast there's two books there's loads more content on social media doctors underscore kitchen and i hope to see you there